TRI Alliance Training Short Course, How Are We Going to Do This? Your speakers today are myself, Lisa Jensen. Uh, John is also around here. And our featured speaker is John Chan, Executive VP of the Durable Slate Company. Just to give you a little bit of information about the TRI Alliance, we offer a variety of resources. You can find all of them on our website at tileroofing.org. Um, we are a manufacturer's organization of clay and concrete tile roofing. And one of our most frequented pages is a contractor search where you can look for someone who has been through one of our training classes. That could be a contractor, manufacturer, supplier, or a consultant that has earned certification through the TRI. We offer two different courses for certification. One is for all 49 states except Florida. And the other is for Florida. And then in addition, we offer free short courses. We have quite a group on the call today, uh, people across the country and even outside of the United States. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to John, John Chan, the Executive VP of the Durable Slate Company. If you don't follow them on Facebook, you really should because they feature a lot of pictures of some really amazing projects. And we're gonna hear about a few of them today. So go ahead, John. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's uh, really nice to be here. So uh, John Jensen and I were talking about this and he asked me to do this because uh, we have some interesting projects and he asked, you know, how do you do this? And that was one of our questions when we first started. So, um, you know, we've performed difficult projects all over the country and even some abroad. So this webinar will highlight some of these projects along with a, a dialogue on how we accomplished uh, some of these projects. So uh, this was the one that piqued John's interest. Uh, this was a 175 foot tall steeple and the Pennsylvania black slates and various flashings were deteriorating and they're actually falling off the roof. Uh, this was super dangerous because there's an adjacent school there and it's just left to the church. You can kind of see it in the picture, but uh, it's a Catholic school. And so they were really, really nervous about all these pieces of flashings and, and slate um, dislodging from the church. So what they really wanted to do was limit any potential danger. At that time in 1993, uh, we were still a, a relatively young company and we never worked on a steeple before. So this was a uh, totally uncharted territory for us back then. So some people ask, why would we tackle something like that when we'd never worked on anything remotely that tall? And, uh, you know, we absolutely love restoring these beautiful buildings back to their original grandeur. And uh, my sister actually attended uh, St. Mary's Elementary School. So I just thought, wow, this is really cool that we'll be able to do this. So the solution uh, was kind of a back and forth. Um, we had the highest bid, but they really agreed with our solution because number one, what was failing? Well, the Pennsylvania black slate was flaking apart and falling. So, you know, they were asking about synthetics and you know, other uh, materials. And we said, well, you know, the best slate is actually Virginia Buckingham and it's going to last hundreds of years. And they said, well, what about it blowing off? And you know, our solution with that was not only would we nail it, but we'd also use stainless steel slate hooks and an adhesive on the back. And then on the copper work, um, we changed out all that old 16 ounce copper with uh, 20 ounce copper. And we made sure that um, all the joints were either locked or soldered in such a fashion that you wouldn't have any kind of failure. And that's kind of what was typical of what was going on up there. Also, if you look at those louvers, uh, before we did that, some of it was wood. And uh, the wood obviously deteriorated because, you know, who's going to get up there and paint all that? Um, the louvers are a little bit lower, but they're still probably 125 feet or so. So that was our solution. And um, actually, I skipped ahead. 
that was our solution. And this photo here was taken, oh, I want to say about six months ago. And it's still in perfect shape. Uh, no slate has come out. Nothing's fallen. And it's in fantastic shape. And it should last for a, a really, really long time. So um, that was back in 93. And since then, we've tackled all kinds of difficult um, roof jobs all over the US because mainly what we've done was look at it and say, you know, what is failing? What does the customer want? And how do we solve this situation for them? But also looking ahead at what else could fail. So this next project here is really, really small. It was a pagoda in New Jersey and the uh, insurance company called me because they couldn't identify the tile. Um, it was really destroyed after Hurricane S uh, Sandy and they got a, a really high quote to custom make the tile. So um, they, they didn't know what the tile was, how to get it. So uh, this roofing contractor gave them a price and, and Liberty Mutual said, oh my gosh, that's, that's a crazy price. So uh, they called me and they said, hey, can you identify this tile? And I said, um, pretty sure I could. Won't you uh, send me pictures and uh, I can look into it. So uh, as you can see, the roof was actually just completely destroyed and it was leaking really bad. So it, it was in this shape for quite some time before we got to it. So a lot of the wood was um, actually deteriorated pretty bad too. So the homeowner, their big thing was they didn't want a replica tile. They wanted the original tile. And um, the insurance company went back and said, hey, look, we can't find this original tile. And that's when they came to me and they said, hey, can you, can you locate this? I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to have to make some calls, but um, we'll, we'll have to figure out uh, where it is made, uh, if it's still made. Um, because what we found out was this is an original uh, Chinese pagoda that was shipped piece by piece from China and uh, erected here in New Jersey. And um, it doesn't quite show it, but there's this big stone um, a few feet away from it with Chinese writing. And the first thing I did with it was I took a picture of it and I sent it to my sister and I asked her what it said. And she said, where did you find this? I said, well, it's in a house in New Jersey. She says, it's a super, super old street sign from China. She's like, it's like hundreds and hundreds of years old. I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, so anyways, I I did some digging and I actually found this, child, uh, this tile manufacturer in China. And uh, so they wanted me to wire them the money and wait three months for delivery. And I'm thinking, well, how's this work? I'm like, you could just walk off with the money. So again, I made some calls and uh, a friend of mine does um, uh, importing from China. And so I got his agent to go over to the uh, manufacturing plant. And uh, basically I had to pay the agent to ensure that our delivery was going to actually happen and um, uh, that I wasn't going to just wire money to China and never see it again. So um, what I did was I was also worried about the shipping because it's going to be shipped to California and then it's going to be put on a truck to uh, Philadelphia and then from Philadelphia it was going to be shipped here to New Jersey. And I was thinking, well, what if the tile breaks? So what I actually did was I ordered double the amount of tile. There was uh, two of every single piece that I needed. So uh, I basically told the homeowner that um, after we're done with this, if this ever happens again, you have actually a whole entire uh, roof here. So um, they were really happy with that. So we also have to learn how to install a tile that we've never seen or touched before. So it was uh, really kind of exciting and uh, it was really, really old and historic. I mean, this uh, company 
had been manufacturing tile for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, <laughs> it was kind of interesting because um, uh, they, they want to know if uh, we wanted like a, a manual on it. And I said, yeah. And uh, well, it's on Chinese and I'm Chinese, but I, I don't read Chinese. So uh, I did look at the pictures. And uh, when we did the um, tear off, we carefully looked at how it was installed. So we went back with the exact same method. Um, you can kind of see here that uh, we put wood battens down and um, the tiles were installed exactly how it was before. And you can see how decorative and ornate it is. I mean, uh, you just don't really see um, tile that's this decorative uh, too much here in the US. So uh, the homeowner was ecstatic because um, not only uh, were we able to do the tile, but it's hard to see. We, we did a lot of the uh, reconstruction of the wood uh, and even some of the glass also. <clears throat> so we ba basically sent two of our restoration guys out there to tear everything off and do all the woodwork and um, get the everything ready. And then I sent our roofing crew in and uh, we put that roof on. And it was actually relatively quick, but um, uh, it took a lot of um, digging, uh, trying to find the <clears throat> correct answers. So uh, this is a, another completely different project. This is the House of Parliament. Uh, it's called the Red House and it's, it's in Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> uh, the issue here was that the House of Parliament was destroyed in a coup attempt in the 90s um, and been sitting empty with no roof for a couple decades. So these people went in with uh, machine guns and they shot everything up. They shot holes in the roof or holes in the ceilings. I mean, it was, it was literally completely destroyed. Because they couldn't figure out what to do with the roof, uh, you can see they actually built this uh, metal building or, or canopy over the entire structure because they tried to get it roofed many, many times since the 90s, and every time it was a complete failure. So what was the risk? There was a lot of risk. How do we make sure we get paid? How do we make sure no one gets hurt? So these are the typical workers that you see in Trinidad. I took a picture of this as I was walking down the street to grab some lunch. You can see a rolling scaffold with all this water underneath them. Uh, the one guy is barefoot on just a wooden plank and the other guy is barefoot and he's uh, washing the windows. And this is really, really typical of construction workers in Trinidad. And so that's something that we had to you know, take notice of and make sure that we were safe. So we had to actually inspect their scaffold. We had to, you know, make sure that, you know, our workers were safe uh, during the, the trips down there. So, you know, this, this project was, it was over 300 squares of Penryn pur Purple Slate, and it was 200 some odd squares of um, copper standing seam. It was over a thousand feet of um, box gutters. And then you had the top, which was a uh, convex copper uh, roof. So we were thinking, how do we do such a project? How do we man a project like this? Or how can we train a workforce that's so limited in knowledge? Here's the inside. And when we look at why do it, it's like, this is a part of history. Um, this is a, a fantastic building that was built by um, English workers, um, you know, back in the day. And it's so incredibly gorgeous on the inside. And that we were going to help restore this was, uh, you know, quite an interesting thing for us. So, um, one of the problems was everybody was telling them how to do the roof. And basically I said, you've got to throw everything away. We're going to draft all the specs. We switched the entire slate roof to a, a stainless steel slate hook method. The reason why is, is that 
there was no way for us to have enough manpower to do this job and also do our project. So what I suggested was, why don't we use the local crews? And they said, oh, this is great because we have a local Slater that's been doing all this work. So I went around and I observed his work. And what I really noticed is that they were under nailing and over nailing all of their roofs. You see two, three, four, five year old slate roofs down there that have 200 missing slates, 80 missing slates, 150 missing slates. And uh, so I said, you can't have these guys nail a slate roof because they don't know what they're doing. So uh, the entire roof was hooked with stainless steel hooks. That way you couldn't over nail or under nail the roof. So then we brought in um, our guys to supervise and train the locals on doing the project correctly and safely. So mainly what we did was we taught them how to properly uh, lay out a roof, how to properly uh, bend and solder sheet metal, uh, copper in this case. And um, then we did the most difficult part, uh, that, that top roof that's a um, curved um, compound uh, radius roof. Uh, we did all that because we were thinking there's no real way to be able to uh, teach people how to do a roof like that. So this is um, the finished product. Uh, it's really interesting because um, I took this uh, picture with, with a drone and uh, after I took the picture and I sent it to the GC, the GC asked, how did you possibly get that picture? And I said, oh, I did it with a drone. And he said, wow, that's really funny. He goes, how'd you get permission? We kept tr applying for permission. We kept getting it uh, denied. I said, oh, I didn't know you needed permission. I just took the pictures. So um, that's why we have this great picture of, of um, our work uh, because I was kind of ignorant. Um, so, okay, so the next project, this is the Frank Lloyd Wright Museum. Uh, the challenge was it was parceled out into apartment buildings and a red shingle roof was installed. And it was really dilapidated by the time we got to it. Um, so on this roof, uh, it was more than just a roof. We did an entire restoration uh, job on this, even building the in interior furniture. Um, so this was our first Frank Lloyd Wright building, and we had to research the tile and the metal and exactly how the original was installed. So Frank Lloyd Wright's probably the most famous architect in U.S. history, and we were getting a chance to restore one of his old houses and actually make it into a museum. So what we uh, finally finished with was it was a new custom-made Ludoisi flat slab shingle tile, and it was installed with all TCS, um, turn coated uh, stainless steel flashings, box gutters, and everything. So, um, yeah, we did all of that exterior work, uh, as well as, like I said, even the interior work of making all the furniture. So, here was the next interesting challenge. Uh, this is the first United Methodist Church. And it had a horrible leak on their huge skylight in the middle of their church. And um, everybody that they called said, no idea how to fix that. You know, it's at the top of your tile roof, right in the middle. Uh, it's extremely difficult access. And trying to build something like that, um, you'd want to do it in place. But, you know, how do you do it in place? And uh, Nobody wanted to tackle this project, uh, so, but it was leaking so bad that it was uh, really destroying the inside of their church. So this church was located uh, downtown, and the problem with the large decorative skylight and cupola in the middle, uh, the access alone was, it was pretty scary. So uh, it was a huge challenge because A, we, we needed to locate some 10-inch conocera tile, and we didn't want to buy new because it's a really old roof. So you're going to put in new Conocera with the old and it's going to look like, you know, it just won't look right. 
Then we had to rebuild the skylight, custom fabricating all of the copper. We had to close down the street and crane it in the position. But, you know, the joy and happiness of the congregation was, it was hard to put into words. I mean, they were just, you know, I mean, people were, had tears in their eyes that it was getting done, you know, because it was such a, a awful thing that they really couldn't find anybody that was even willing to give them a price to do it. But uh, we not only did it, but we uh, custom fabricated all of the work um, exact to what it was before. So uh, the solution won both the NRCA Gold Circle Award for Project of the Year, as well as the Gold Circle Award for Safety Solutions. Uh, because we basically closed the street down, brought a crane in, and craned everything into position, and uh, did everything safely with with no accidents. And as you can see, that you know that copper is pretty decorative, and um, you know that skylight, it's got to be done just right because you know you don't want a skylight that's going to break or leak or you know have issues if you get hail or so that was uh, quite the unique project. Uh, the next project, this is St. Andrews. Um, the church found out that their twin steeples were leaning away from each other and uh, the slate was all face nailed and the copper was all split apart. Uh, the wood was rotten and the masonry was falling apart. So uh, they actually got uh, termites in there and they were eating away at the wood and every contractor that they said that they called looked at it and said that's way too dangerous of a of a situation yeah, as far as the roofing contractors and then the general contractors looked at it and said okay well the you've got all the de decorative copper you've got all that slate work you've got all that historic masonry you need like a, a specialist and again they really couldn't find anybody to tackle this project. They, they were really scratching their heads. So um, the risk was, you know, we had an engineering study done and we sh showed that the copper ornaments had split uh, from the wooden steeple movement. And basically all that water just kept running down and running down and rotting everything out. So what we did was, here's one of the steeples, we, we chopped them off and we craned them down. And uh, uh, while the uh, new ones were being built, uh, we did all the historic um, restoration to the stone and the uh, uh, mortar joints. So we had uh, new steeples built out of um, structural steel and we dropped structural steel I-beams into the church. And we got everything anchored and we craned the new steeples in the place after we put the wood on. And um, here's why we did it. You know, ever since going to the Dachenwan in Germany, the, the Dachenwan is roof and wall. Dock is roof, wand is wall. It was a, a roofing show. We saw what some of these European roofers were doing and we wanted to perform that type of quality of work. You know, the, the quality of work that we see in the US versus the quality of work that we saw uh, while we were in Germany, we were like, okay, this is kind of kid stuff over here. We, we got to really learn how to uh, be um, at the top of the top. And why I put this picture in is that one of the problems was, you know, this is a 175 foot steeple and this church sits on top of this hill. So with all the wind and just how, how, much it sways, all that copper was just splitting apart. And that's one of the reasons why we put those structural steel I-beams in. So it's not really wood anymore. It's all this big structure of structural steel. And then this copper that you see, um, all the difficult or, or um, stuff that would sway, we made those out of uh, 40 ounce copper and it was welded. So that's not soldered, it's all welded together and it's super strong. So you can see here the, the scaffolds being taken down. And as, as I stated, you know, we basically chopped it off, structural steel put in, 
the new slate roof was installed with copper nails, stainless steel hooks, and an adhesive. 40 ounce welded copper was used on all the large ornamental pieces so it wouldn't split and leak. So now they've got steeples that will last way more than the 100 years that the original uh, steeples lasted. So this was uh, challenge number two. Um, the rest of the roof, it wasn't just the steeples, the main roof had really similar problems. Uh, here you can see where we've taken off a lot of the stones uh, because many of them were cracked or uh, chipped or destroyed. And we had to take them apart and um, certain ones had to be uh, remade uh, and then put back into position. So um, we put a whole new slate roof on, all new copper gutters, um, copper louvers, everything. One of the issues was that the center spire had to be replaced, but the roof structure couldn't support scaffold. So again, we chopped the, um, the center spire off, we built it on the ground, and then we anchored it. Um, you can see those two large cranes there. Uh, we anchored it back into place after the slate roof was installed. And why did we do it? Well, the, the church simply didn't trust anyone else to tackle it because, you know, after the first project, this is a picture of uh, the steeple. After the first project, uh, they were just like, you know, um, everything went exactly as planned and this is, this is what we should do for the rest of the roof. So, you know, the solution was just planning each part so that it could be completed safely and effectively. And again, we used all new Virginia Buckingham slate and uh, the, now the entire um, church has been completely restored. All the masonry and, and uh, slate and copper. Um, and you can see those copper gutters too. Everything's completely redone. Okay, so this project uh, is Steeple Square. Um, Steeple Square was a, a very unique um, issue. So here they brought us out and asked us to replace this uh, wood shingle roof. And our question was, why? So if you put this wood roof back on, who's going to maintain it? Who's going to paint it? You know, this the steeple is somewhere around 250 feet tall. So you're going to have somebody go up there and, and scrape and paint it every five years. So our solution was, hey, let's do something different. You know, they said that the project had to be done in eight months because of, of winter up there, and they wanted to match everything exactly. So we had to match the decorative wood. And here's the interesting thing. None of it was identical from one face to another. Um, it was all slightly different. So even though these pieces were made uh, exact, when they got up there, we had to alter them to make sure that they fit onto the roof. So why tackle a project like that? Well, just the sheer beauty of this building and knowing that it would last more than a century was, you know, just something more than we could possibly pass up. So it's one of the most unique projects we've ever done and we actually love these kinds of challenges yeah you know, we love the the challenges where people say hey this is what we've got going on but um you know everybody else says it can't be done and uh we love taking a look at it and saying well this is how you could do it or you know giving them solutions so this was the solution and we used really great teamwork in getting the sheet metal guys from all the different offices to work together and this project won the nrca gold circle award the cda uh that's copper development association nrca is national roofing contractors association uh the cda project of distinction and it's the only winner of the ifd uh that's the international federation of roofing contractors it's d because in german um uh, roof is dach so uh, for an American company, uh, no American company's ever won this award. It always goes to, you know, some European firm that's usually been around for hundreds of years. So we kind of came full circle with that award 
uh, because we always want to be able to say that we did world class work. And that was um, that was really great to see that happen after going to the Dock and Lawn back in the day. Okay, so I think I kind of sped through that, maybe a little bit too fast, but um, do we have uh, any questions? Um, no, I think that was perfect, John. And yes, um, you can either submit questions in writing using the question feature on GoToWebinar, or I will open up the mics. And if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll call you by name. And I know John is standing here just chomping at the no. top of the question probably. Yeah, not really a question. Just first of all, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I met John the first time in New Orleans, not too long after Katrina. I think a, a couple of years, we had done very minor work down there. And John took me for a, a, a half a day drive and we saw more fantastic roofs that he had been involved in and a part of. Uh, I think I remember there was some copper that you had painted gray so it would stop getting stolen, the bottom, the bottom 10 feet of the town spout. But uh, yeah, just kind of blown away. And, and you talk about some of these things like, uh, like I might talk about doing something a little silly on vacation and yet you're getting yourself into a project that's uh, part of a 200 year old process. So I'm very impressed. Well, thanks, John. Yeah, actually, I, now that you say that, I remember that day. That, that was a church where we put up a lot of brand new copper, but because of, of theft, uh, we, use lead coated copper for all the downspouts so it wasn't actually painted but uh oh. they remain there today nobody knows that they're copper <laughs> because it looks like galvanized steel maybe i put painted ones back up you don't know <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah but uh so, yeah it was great meeting you guys I, I did the tri course back in i want to say about 08 or so is my guess sounds about right yeah that was lots of fun, yeah. Well, listen, we appreciate you coming on today and we'll get this uh, recording up uh, probably before Monday and so that it'll it'll be out there and, and just really appreciated getting to see some of those projects. Great, not, well, thank you. Not seeing any questions, we'll close the webinar. All right, well, everybody have a great weekend and John, thank you again. Sure. Well, here's the funny thing. I'm getting a bunch of texts on my phone with questions. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, are you guys able to hear me by chance? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I raised my hand in the uh, in the little chat thing, and I just didn't know if I uh, was muted still by the admin. Um, yeah, my name's Matt. John, you and I have uh, had the pleasure of talking on Facebook a couple of times, uh, even recently within the last week, and you're the one who sent me the link. Um, I've got five or six of the team members from our company uh, that I threw on this chat with us just to uh, kind of see some of your projects out there and expand their imagination of what's possible in the industry. Um, I, I had a quick question that had, has more to do with the development of how you became the expert in the industry that you are, because I'm also familiar with several of the European firms like you talked about that have been around for hundreds of years in areas where they're still tradesmen. So how did you, uh, in the States, get the knowledge that you have and, and what set you, what, what path did you take to build and to develop your industry knowledge? Well, it's actually really interesting because I, I would say it has to do with a, a level of interest. You know, I've I've kind of traveled all through um, Europe um, and observing certain rivers and going to the different slate quarries there, um, picking up uh, the European books uh, on slate and sheet metal and talking to people that have uh, been trained over there. Um, you know, guys like uh, Tommy Ban uh, from, from WUCO, um, uh, Philippe Paulian, um, you know, and, and, you know, these guys are like, guys have been, you know, officially trained over there. And then there's uh, uh, Alden Gibbs, who he's, I think he's the only American to ever graduate from the, the French school, uh, slate school over there. So I've talked to a lot of them and I've, I've you know, looked at various books and whatnot and, I think part of it also is that whenever we got that challenging roof, we went ahead and we said, okay, we're gonna do it. Um, even though there are some really big challenges that, 
really might scare people away. Like, you know, some of those ruse that were in the presentation uh, made people nervous. So that's why they were really only able to get one price because most guys would just say, I don't know how to do that. Um, and even just, I think it was last year when we did the, the Norwegian embassy, you know, they wanted that pre-patinaed copper. They wanted the um, uh, convex uh, stand, double lock standing seam. And then they also wanted to turn up the wall. And uh, so the only real way to do that is to do pinch seams and not solder anything. Because if you solder anything, you're gonna have to take the patina off, solder it, and then try and get that patina back on there. And it's, you know, it's the front of the Norwegian embassy. And it's like, it, I was literally just about to ask you that. My second question had to do with the job that you didn't talk about, which was the Norwegian embassy where you did the uh, the chemical treatment to get the patina going ahead of time. And I was going to ask you about that process, but I didn't want to get too ADD on the convo. Right. So uh, that was a job that was really challenging. And again, most guys didn't want to do that for several reasons. Number one, it carried with it a $5,000 a day penalty for uh, going past their, their deadline. Number two is that um, if the wood isn't right, well, your copper, no matter how well you do it, isn't going to look right because uh, if, if the wood had any imperfections to it, it's going to telegraph through. So we actually insisted on doing all the woodwork uh, before doing the copper. And uh, that bought us a little bit of extra time. So uh, in, in doing that, instead of buying pre-patina copper off the shelf, say like from Revere, we actually had that made by a, a guy named Eric Berg, uh, DLSS. And so uh, it's, you don't want a patina that's going to come off really easily, unless it's kind of like in a box gutter or something where it doesn't matter. But um, on this, where it's really visible on a, a front face, you want that patina to be as, as sound as possible. And then, you know, again, like I said, you, you want it to make it look um, as perfect as possible with, with that curve. So we used um, uh, these stainless steel clips that were fixed at the bottom, but were sliding in the middle. Because what happens with the temperature changes is that if you don't do something like that, the copper roof, when it gets hot, is it's going to be oil. It's going to look awful. Um, so you know, there's there's various considerations to uh, think about when when doing a project like that. But so many of these projects, it just kind of takes um, a person thinking about what are all the different obstacles that you know can impede a great job. So the woodwork was one. The temperature changes were another. The, the solder running down the face was another. So if, if you just kind of look at the project and think what all the different um, problems could be, where it could go wrong, and you iron all that out, and then you go forward with that solution, you'll have curveballs thrown in, like you know somebody driving their lift in your roof after you've got the panels on. We, we had that happen out there. But um, instead of having a bunch of curveballs, you, you only have like one or two, and it doesn't throw you off. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for going into that. Um, I'll give a second for anyone else to ask another question, and if not, I have, uh, I have one other. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time, so go ahead. Yeah, so um, I've had I've had opportunities to scope and bid a couple of jobs overseas as well, and uh, one of the things that was really interesting about your uh, Trinidad and Tobago project that you had uh, that immediately, just as somebody who's been through the the ropes on that, um, I wanted to ask you on a job like that. Um, Given your experience and everything, I still have to imagine that it takes a tremendous amount of time to scope and that there's got to be a little bit of fear inside of you whenever you submit your estimate. <laughs> because like, you know, I, I would I would imagine there's still a, a, a factor even with your experience where you go, I, I, I don't know what I could run into or what could go wrong or how I could be upside down on this job. But what does your scope process on a job like that typically look like and how long does it take you? 
Well, um, each of those projects is a little bit different. Um, but one of the things that I do is they've got to pay me uh, for looking at it. So, um, you know, I, I charge them to go look at the project. And at first, when they said that they wanted to use their specs instead of my suggestion, I said, OK, great. I said, I can't be a part of this project. So, um, you know, all of a sudden they're like, well, we just threw all that money away. Um, you've got to be able to draw the line, meaning that you can't let somebody uh, push you into doing something that you're not comfortable with. Um, you know, the same goes with payment. I said that, um, uh, you know, you're going to have to pay us before we come down. I said, so uh, you have to wire us the money. Once we get the wire, then I'll, you know, get airplane tickets and everything else. And they're like, well, we're not really comfortable with wiring that kind of money to a company in another country. And I said, okay, great. So then hire somebody else. And, you know, uh, they came back and they said, okay, well, I guess that's what we're going to do. Um, I just didn't get into that position of being um, upside down. Um, there was a project that I bid in Argentina that they really wanted to use us and um, we just couldn't really come to terms on, on payment. You know, uh, they, they wanted to pay so much and put it into escrow and, you know, all these different things. I said, you know what, we don't have to do this job. So you either pay us up front, as I stated, or, you know, you find somebody else. And they went back and forth and finally they found somebody else. Um, I'm just not going to get into that position. Uh, I mean, you know, those jobs are cool, but, you know, there's a dozen other cool jobs behind it. So um, most of the jobs abroad uh, don't pan out. So uh, that's one of the things that I always think with that, you know, if I get a, a question for a job abroad, I don't really jump on it really fast. I, I actually let them chase me a little bit because I know that chances of it um, are pretty slim. So even that Trinidad job, they actually had to chase me down because they, you know, they they sent me the the prints. I said, okay, yeah, let me look at it. And they said, hey, have you looked at it? I said, yeah. I'm like, uh, let, let me think about it because that really gauges a little bit of their interest. You know, if they're trying to just get whoever they can at the cheapest price, we're not it. Um, and I, I usually tell them that. Um, and I, you know, we, we get a lot of inquiry. So if you get all these inquiries and, and you try and chase every single one, you're not really gonna have enough time. So um, where I see that it's a dead end, I just tell them right off the bat, uh, you should probably look for somebody else. We're not your company. Fantastic. Thanks for that feedback, John. You're welcome. Great. Well, thank you, Matthew, for the questions. And John, you are ending right on time. So thank you for that.